Well, thanks everyone for joining us. My name is uh, Dr. Rebecca Mears. I'm a member of the Venn Foundation Student Debt Education Team. Really excited to be joining you today for this great topic. Uh, and I also want to say thank you to ACVIM for helping to host this and spread awareness. I would say, would you all like to, to say hi and any other information? Sure, I'll just say a few words. I'll just take a minute to um, thank the VIN Foundation um, for partnering with us on this important series and in particular taking the time to really tailor this presentation to the unique needs of our large animal diplomates because we know this is one of the top well-being factors that's impacting you all. So we look forward to continuing to partner with VIN on sessions like this as well as providing other non-medical topics for you in the future. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, we're really excited to pair with ACBAM on this. This is a it's an important topic for everyone, but like you said, especially for our, our large animal internists, it's a it's a great topic to really dive into today. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started here. Uh, we do try to keep the chat for any technical issues. So if you're having any issues during the presentation, please let us know in the chat and we'll help you troubleshoot those there. The Q&A is also open as well. And so any questions that you have throughout the presentation, please feel free to use that Q&A feature. Find that button down on the bottom of your screen. You can also ask questions anonymously there in case you're more comfortable doing so that way. And then you can also upvote questions as well. So that way we're able to make sure that the questions that are the most prominent during our discussion today are the ones that we're gonna be answering live. So those are a couple of things there. This and anyone joining us live, you are able to get two hours of CE for this um, presentation as well. There will be an evaluation that you have to fill out. We'll drop that link in the chat a couple of times. We'll also send it out via email. There will be a follow-up email with a recording of today's session, that uh, CE evaluation link and some other follow-up information. That will come from studentdebt at vinfoundation.org. And then once you fill out that CE evaluation, that will come from jordan at vinfoundation.org. So just keep an eye out for those emails. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tony Bartels, and we're going to get started here. Wow. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, ACVIM. And how nice to have an extra 20 or 25 minutes or so after last week's um, poorly timed power outage on my end. So this is much more relaxed than, than the... Uh, hectic start to last week. So uh, thanks again for joining and thanks to everybody who provided those um, primary concerns on their registration. I have baked a lot of those primary concerns into the presentation here. I saw a lot uh, regarding public service loan forgiveness, right? So I think many of you um, large animal folks are either working for or planning to work for potentially an academic institution or in some other nonprofit capacity. So we'll make sure that we talk about that as well. Uh, but we're also gonna talk about, you know, what happens if you don't qualify for public service loan forgiveness and talk about the repayment options that that you have there as well. Um, this is super exciting. I mean, I, I'm a veterinarian, Becca's a veterinarian. We both manage our student loans and help the veterinary community through VIN manage their student loans. So we've got a lot of experience in terms of the good, bad, the ugly, um, kind of the gold standards, if you will, in terms of taking care of your student loans from any number of career path standpoints. And I'm also married to um, an ACVIM diplomat. She's a small animal internal medicine practitioner here in the front range area of Colorado where we live and work. So um, we've got a lot of experience on what to do and what not to do with student loans. So please feel free to ask questions along the way, uh, particularly as they pertain to your circumstances. There have been a lot of changes recently um, and they're still kind of coming. So we're gonna make sure everybody's aware of what those look like and what they mean for you and your repayment strategies. And we're also going to show you some tools that we use and, and ways that you can get help if you need uh, more specific assistance than we can provide during these open sessions like this. So um, we're going to cover all of that ground today and then ultimately leave it to your questions and make sure that we get all of the questions we can answer before we leave this session. Um, just because I saw a lot of questions about public service loan forgiveness, I'm going to kick this off here. Let me find my polling window. And then you guys should see a poll. And then it'll kind of help me know 
how much or how little time to spend on certain topics. Cool. And one of the things I, I think is exciting too, I saw in the last session as well as this session are, are some folks who might be overseeing some uh, programs, some residency programs that are just looking for more information on how to better help some of those folks as they work their way through that advanced training, which I think is super exciting, as well as many of you who are now had enough experience on your own with student loans to then be able to pass some of that information down to the folks that you may be mentoring yourselves. Cool, I'll just let this poll run for another few seconds here. And that's shared. It looks like most of you are using income driven repayment, a few of you on the public service loan forgiveness front, and then the I don't have student loans kind of rounding out that particular um, poll result. So thanks for completing that. All right, so let's we're gonna dive in and, and here's some of the uh, topics we're going to cover. And really it's just a matter of kind of using or tapping into that clinical brain of yours to do what I call a good physical exam of your student loans. So we're gonna dive in and, and look at that, um, how you can do that yourself so you have an idea of what to do next with your student loans. Because everybody's pathway to and through veterinary school as well as beyond is, is so different that it's hard to provide general advice. And, and certainly there is some general advice that we're going to cover here, but it really works best if we know more specifics um, in terms of what we're dealing with. So that's where this student loan physical exam is going to come in. There's been a number of changes over the decades, really, in terms of how you can finance a uh, education like a veterinary school education. So a lot of that has, you know, your payment options have a lot to do with where you were in that time frame when you were borrowing. So I'm going to encourage everybody and I'm going to show you how to do this to go obtain their federal student aid data file. So if you use student loans for any reason um, during your college or um, graduate school education, you're going to have a student aid data file. And in that data file, it's going to contain kind of all of the hairy details that you're going to need to know in order to assess your repayment options and how to make best use of the benefits that have been put in place or are kind of changing, expiring uh, as a result of some of the recent changes we've seen with student loans. So you're either going to have a chunk of federal student loans, which is the case I see for the majority of veterinarians, um, or you may still have or also have some private student loans. Private student loans won't show up in a federal student aid data file, right? So only the loans that you took that are kind of were facilitated through the Department of Education will show up in that federal student aid data file, but you may also have private loans. I, I more commonly see private loans associated with undergraduate educations, or for those folks who may have refinanced their federal student loans into a private student loan after the fact, right? So private student loans are really um, governed more by the contract you signed when you took those out. Right? So unfortunately, they will not benefit from any of the federal student loan repayment plans or benefits like public service loan forgiveness or the income driven plans. Um, but private student loans are, are laid out, your repayment options are laid out in that what's called a master promissory note of the contract that you signed with that particular lender for that particular loan, right? And you may have multiple different contracts or different loans that you might have taken, right? So private student loans, really are highly variable, right? So you have to look at those contracts and we can cover questions about private student loans here as well, but it really is going to depend on what the contract says for that particular student loan. Your federal student loans, thankfully the contracts are all relatively the same, right? And they can benefit from uh, income driven plans, public service loan forgiveness, um, you know, forgiveness and the special pandemic forbearance benefits uh, that have been available uh, for the last nearly four years. All of those are kind of a function of the federal law governing those federal student loans. If you've lost track of anything, dive into your credit report, right? So you can uh, assess one of these or obtain one of these for free from the major reporting entities at least once per year. Um, during the pandemic period, they were letting people do that once a week because there was a lot of shenanigans going on um, with identity theft, but it's always a good habit to get into. But you know, I find for people who are struggling to find all of the loans that they may have amassed during their higher education career, um, I point them to annualcreditreport.com. So that is gonna show you all of your open lines of credit 
Um, so any federal student loans that you lost track of or private loans or utility bills that might still be outstanding from all the moving that you've been doing, things like that are going to show up on that credit report. So once a year when I file my taxes, I, I grab that credit report and just make sure that I'm recognizing everything that's on there, right? So that's where you'll find some of those um, sources of identity theft as well, right? So if somebody obtained your information out there somehow and opened a line of credit in your name that you don't recognize, that's how you can identify that and address those particular issues. If you're gonna go make a major purchase or anything, you know, you're gonna wanna check this as well because the bank or the lender or the whoever is going to be checking into you is also going to check this credit report, right? So generally a good rule of thumb is for you to know what's on there before they do, right? Because you don't want to hear any surprises from a bank when you go to buy a home or a practice or, you know, some mobile unit or whatever it is that you're going to be uh, financing. You don't want that bank to be coming to you saying, hey, what's this? So forbearance benefits um, that we all got very almost too accustomed to um, are over, right? So they ended on August 31st. Interest has been turned back on. So it's been on for not quite two weeks, but since September 1st, interest on all federally held student loans has been reinstated. Um, so we're gonna wanna understand what impact that's going to have, especially if you graduated at some point during this pandemic forbearance period. Payments are set to resume this October, right? So this is, you know, we've got a couple of weeks left here. Um, you're gonna wanna grab that student aid data file or at least log into your loan servicer account because we saw some loan servicer shuffling as well during the pandemic forbearance period. And you wanna know what that first payment's going to be and does it make sense, right? Does it align with what your current financial circumstances are? Um, is there an opportunity for you to have a lower payment? Um, if you're using an income-driven plan, while many of most of you said that you were, you know when you're next due to provide that new income information because nobody's been required to renew their income information during the forbearance benefit period, right? So what you kind of entered that period with in terms of repayment is generally what you'll be exiting the forbearance period owing, right? So it's a matter of how long that payment will stay in effect until you're next due to renew. Um, and then, you know, you do get forgiveness credit. I, stu I see this quite a uh, question asked quite a bit, no matter what you are doing with your student loans during that forbearance benefit period, uh, you will receive forgiveness credit for that time. And that's gonna kind of dovetail nicely into the one-time count adjustment that we're gonna talk about a lot because it's one of the biggest benefits that's out there right now. And it's a limited time benefit, right? So, you know, if for those of you that may not have maximized that benefit, or this is the first time you're hearing of it, uh, there's some opportunity yet for you to take advantage of what's called the one-time forgiveness count adjustment. All right, so some of the questions that you submitted, so enrolling in the correct IBR with my new loan servicing company to meet public service loan forgiveness requirements, absolutely, right? We wanna make sure that you're you know, that information has transferred over correctly. If you've got a, loon, a new loan servicer that you're using the most beneficial repayment strategy you can be. And then if it overlaps with public service loan forgiveness, we wanna make sure that you're paying the least amount possible. Uh, clarifying that loans that were started to be repaid 20 years ago and, and forgiven after 20 or 25 years, is this still true? Now that, I think what that person's asking about has to do with that one-time forgiveness count adjustment, right? And we're gonna to get to that a little bit later in the session, but essentially anything that anybody's been doing over the last, since 1994, essentially, is going to be counted as forgiveness time, right? Except for the time that you spent in school. So that is a huge bonus, right? For those of us that might have some older loans or have a relatively tortured path to get to our career goals, um, we could be looking at some significant forgiveness eligible time, which lessens the amount of repayment time we have remaining until we reach forgiveness. Uh, then consolidation is another huge question. You know, do I need to consolidate? In some cases, you need to consolidate to fully maximize for this one-time count adjustment. In other cases, you need to consolidate just to make sure all of your loans are eligible for something like public service loan forgiveness or the newest version of income-driven repayment called SAVE. Right, so consolidation can be a really helpful tool, particularly right now and the end of the year, to clean up any messiness that you might see in your federal student loan portfolio. Right, so if you've got loans other than direct loans, 
right? So these federal family education loans, Perkins loans, health professional student loans, loans for disadvantaged students, those are all different types of federal student loans that can be consolidated and made eligible for things like income driven repayment and public service loan forgiveness. Tony, before right. we move on too far from the um, end of the pandemic forbearance period, there is a question here that I think is, is great for everyone to hear. Um, it's just about the confusion that we're seeing in regards to refunds of any loan payments that were made during the COVID forbearance time. Uh, and the idea being that paying off the paying down that student loan balance during the time of no interest. What do you what can you share about refunds right now? Yeah, so that was a perfect segue into that next piece of information that popped up on the screen there, right? So if you've made payments, you can attempt to request a refund. Um, it's a little bit unclear as to whether or not the refund opportunity is still available or not. Um, they haven't been very straightforward with that. Your loan servicers may tell you that has expired. Uh, if they have, then go uh, while you're logged into studentaid.gov submit a complaint and say you think you should still be able to uh, retrieve a refund. So what I'm hearing recently is that some loan servicers are still telling people that they can't request a refund. Others are telling them that they can. Um, it's still going to take some time to get that refund. Um, you're looking at weeks, if not months, for them to process that. Uh, but when the forbearance benefits were in place, you did have the opportunity to request a refund of any payments that were made between March 13th of 2020 and August 28th of 2023. So if that is you and you think you have the potential to reach loan forgiveness, either public service loan forgiveness or income driven plan forgiveness, or you could otherwise use that money towards other areas of your financial wellness, which I generally find um, are lacking in the veterinary profession, uh, then request that refund, right? But it has gotten more complicated since we're now past that forbearance benefit period. They didn't really bake into law what the, you know, when that should end exactly. So it's been kind of left up to discretion and they haven't really laid that out very, um, very well. So it's a little bit of a gray area right now, but I would still be trying, particularly like in the question some that, that you asked, if it was, they were large payments and, you know, it, there's a chance for you to hit loan forgiveness, then, then I would be trying to get those refunds if I can. All right, so let's look and see uh, how to do this student loan physical exam. So I'm gonna head over to studentaid.gov. I've never seen that happen before. All right, so studentaid.gov, this is where you're going to go to retrieve this student aid data file. This is where you would start your consolidation if it makes sense for you to do so. This is where you can apply for an income-driven plan. This is also where you can renew your income information if your payment, uh, if you're due to renew or you're going to uh, apply or change repayment plans and otherwise have to provide additional income information. So this is kind of that dashboard, if you will, for all things federal student loans. And I'm going to log in here. And this got some additional security recently. That they have to send me a text message. But thankfully, it's super quick. Carry language. And then this is going to take me to kind of a summary of my student loan balance, right? So you guys are going to see my student loan balance here. So $171,000 remaining. However, this is not really enough information for me to uh, make any decisions. Although I can see my new loan servicer and my payment that's due, which they've conveniently screwed up, which I'm still in the process of trying to get them to correct before payments start here in October. I'm gonna hit that view details button, right? Cause that's gonna take me to the next page in here, this aid summary page. And I'm looking for this download my aid data, right? This is the button that's going to allow me to save this ugly looking text file that has all of my higher education borrowing history baked into it. Right, so we want to save that as a TXT file, right? 
save that to your computer somewhere. And then we're gonna come back and try the VIN Foundation Student Debt Center, right? So that's where we're gonna head over to next, the VIN Foundation My Student Loans tool, right? And here, this is gonna ask you to log in, right? And if you have a VIN username and password from when you were a student or when you were doing your residency, or maybe you're you know, still a VIN member now, you can log in, right? Now, whether you're a, a paying VIN member or not, it doesn't really matter. We're just looking for you to have a username and password to log in with, right? So we'll provide student loan help to any veterinarian. Um, all we, we just need you to have some kind of login information, right? And so that's the VIN username and password we're looking for. And you can set up a VIN username and password through VIN Foundation as well if you don't otherwise have a VIN membership. So we can still get you access to the special areas behind the scenes where we provide personalized assistance for veterinarians. But if you're logged in while using this, so now I'm logged in, it gives me access to the special student debt message board area where I can do some research or post my questions about my student loans, but it'll also allow me to kind of track my progress here, right? So I, if I upload my file, it will keep that information under my account so I don't have to necessarily do that same thing tomorrow if I wanna take a look at this tomorrow or this weekend, right? You upload it once and we'll save it in here and you can pull the most recent files up again in this My Student Loans tool, right? So that's the username and password that we're looking for when we ask you to log in. Um, I'm gonna upload that student aid data file and I've got a different sample one that I'm going to use as an example here. Right, so this is a 2014 graduate. And this is some, this one just kind of highlights some of the information that I'm I'm looking for. Right. So uh, from a one time count adjustment standpoint, but just kind of, you know, assessing the types of things that might pop up when you upload your student aid data file in here, and then just generally how I walk through this. Right. So I'm looking to see how many loans I have, the principal, the unpaid interest. Right. That used to be a thing, was not a thing for a while when the pandemic forbearance benefit happened. Now it's going to be a thing again. Right, so unpaid interest, if you make payments that are below the monthly interest accrual, which can commonly happen with an income-driven repayment plan, that interest gets added to this unpaid interest balance, right? But it's separate from your principal. Your interest rate determines how much interest is generated from your principal balance. Right, so this is one of the I guess let's call it lesser known benefits of your federal student loans. Not only do they allow you to make payments that are below the interest accrual, depending on what your income and family size are in the plan that you choose, uh, but that in that shortfall falls into a separate bucket that doesn't charge you additional interest, right? So you normally don't see that on other types of loans, right? So that's a pretty significant benefit. And one of the even better benefits of the newer income-driven plan that was just released a few weeks ago called SAVE will eliminate unpaid interest going forward, right? So if you have a payment that's less than your monthly interest accrual, the government will cover that difference, right? So in this, this example actually illustrates that, right? So this person's monthly payment is $480. Their monthly interest accrual is $1,372, right? They're short on their interest, covering their interest by you know $900 a month. Right, so that's where this unpaid interest balance was coming from while they're using pay as you earn, but with a newer plan called save, right? It comes with an unpaid interest subsidy, which means the difference between this monthly payment and this monthly interest will no longer get added to that unpaid interest. Right, so that's a significant benefit to that newer repayment plan. But then there's also differences we have to talk about between save and a plan like pay as you earn that we'll get to later right? Because there's pros and cons to sticking with one or the other. One of the other things that you might notice is here we'll identify if we've detected that you made a monthly payment to your student loans during that special pandemic forbearance window that March 13th, 2020 through um, August 28th, 2023. If we've noticed that the most recent payment was during that time frame, then we'll pop this little message up here. That's a trigger for you to decide if you want to call your loan servicer and request a refund. 
I'm, I'm going to look at some of the other information in here. I'm looking to see, you know, do I have a bunch of different loans left or do I have just a couple of loans left, right? Which repayment plan are they in, right? So this is under the hide and show details button, right? If I hit the show details, I'll see my repayment plan, page you earn, I'll see my anniversary date, right? So when you use an income driven repayment plan every year, at least, except during the forbearance benefit period, you'll have to provide updated income information. Right now, all of that anniversary date has gotten kicked into the future because of the special COVID forbearance period. So in here, we see that this person is normally due or would next be due to renew in October, which is next month. However, as part of the exit of the pandemic forbearance benefits, nobody is due to renew between the end of the forbearance benefit period and at least six months after that. Right? So and if they're if your anniversary date falls in between now and that six month, let's call it another grace period, if you will, then you can add a year to it. Right. So this person's payment, no matter what their income has done over the last three and a half years, this person's payment can still be $480 a month until they're next due to renew October of 2024. Right, so that's where we want to look at when, you know, what plan am I using? What's my current monthly payment? When am I next due to renew? Right, that's that's the first kind of set of exercises I'm going through in that student loan physical exam. So I know, well, all right, my payment's pretty low compared to what my income might be right now. So it probably doesn't make a lot of sense for me to do any major switching, right? Unless I have some other compelling reason to do so. Right, if my income has decreased for some reason, um, or I would significantly benefit from the new save plan because my payment would be lower and I would get that unpaid interest subsidy, you know, maybe it makes sense to switch now versus waiting. But in most cases, when your payment is lower than it otherwise might be, if you were to renew right now, then I want to sit on that payment until I'm next due to renew. Right, particularly if I'm working towards forgiveness. And in this particular case, this person is working towards public service loan forgiveness, right? And we can see in this PSLF status tab, they have logged a significant amount of time already towards public service loan forgiveness. But they've also got a good chunk of their loans that have a significant amount of PSLF qualifying time, but another smaller chunk that has, you know, half as much, right? So that's, a, that's another one of those triggers for me where I'm looking at it and saying, oh, this person could really benefit from consolidating their loans, right? So they can have their new consolidation loan receive the maximum repayment forgiveness qualifying time. And that, that pertains to public service loan forgiveness or if you're just working towards income-driven repayment forgiveness as well. Right? It could be a little bit harder to know whether or not you have some bonus forgiveness time to be had under um, cases where we don't see what your forgiveness eligible time is. And for currently, public service loan forgiveness is the only program that's actually counting your forgiveness time. Right now, in 2024, we're going to see everybody who's using any kind of repayment plan, but particularly income driven repayment, start counting their forgiveness eligible time. And we'll be able to see that like we can now for folks that are working for public service loan forgiveness. Right. And that's coming. That's happening now, but it's it won't be displayed in your data file until sometime in 2024. All right. So repayment options. Oh, and then let, let me kind of come back here. One of the things, one of the other key things I'm looking for in the income in the my student loans, student loan physical exam is under this income driven repayment eligibility tab. Right. So which income driven plans you're able to use is determined by when you started borrowing, the types of loans you have, right? So all of that is kind of already set, right? So we can run some algorithms on the data that's in that file and pop out a result, right? So we can see here that this person is eligible for the older version of IBR, Pageorn, which is the plan that they're using, as well as the newest plan called SAVE, which used to be known as Repay. Right. Now, the only plan that they're not eligible for is the new version of IBR. Right? And to be eligible for the new version of IBR, you can't have a federal student loan 
before July 1st of 2014. All right, so you're either eligible for the old version of IBR or the new version. Can't be both, right? Can't even be partial, one or the other, right? So in this case, the old version of IBR, which is pretty much obsolete at this point with the release of the new save plan, page one, which is an extremely beneficial, used to be the most beneficial repayment plan pretty much for everybody if you were eligible for it. Problem was not everybody was eligible for it, right? And for those folks, we had repay, which then got updated to save, right? Which is an extremely beneficial repayment strategy itself. Sometimes it's better than pay, sometimes not, right? So that's where we have some comparing to do, and we'll do that with the student loan repayment simulator in just a little bit. That kind of sets the foundation for, you know, we talked a lot about the income-driven repayment plans, and that's mostly because the income-driven plans are very confusing, right? But they can be really beneficial as well. But you can also choose a time-driven plan, right? You can choose to pay your loans back on a traditional standard 10-year plan, right? So that basically takes your principal, the interest rate, and calculates what the payment needs to be to extinguish that balance in that particular time frame. So 10 years, 15, 20, 25, or even 30, if you've consolidated your loans, right? The problem with the time-driven plans is they don't really care about your income, right? And this is particularly important for those of you that have worked your way through the specialty training, right? So, you know, during your internship residency, you're not getting paid very much, right? So you can't really choose a time-driven plan with a veterinary education size student loan balance, right? I mean, if you've got $200,000 of student loans, the standard 10-year plan payment is $2,200 a month, right? So that's all, if not close to all of your take-home pay while you're doing an internship and residency. Right, so you can't really use those plans while you're navigating those specialty training, right? And depending on how much student loan balance you have, right, even if you're a specialist now, some of these payments are just ridiculously high, right? And that's a function of the balance, right? Those time-driven plans don't care what your income is, they only care how much you borrowed and what your interest rate is, right? Now the income-driven plans, only available to your federal student loans, take into account your income and your family size, right? Now that, that's good and bad, right? Not only are there too many options or there were too many options to choose from previously, uh, but, and it was hard to kind of figure out which one should you choose, but it also requires you to kind of be an active participant in your student loan repayment strategy for 20 or 25 years, right? These time-driven plans are pretty much set it and forget it, right? The payment is a function of how much you borrowed. Every month you have to pay the same amount. And when you reach that time frame, your balance is gone. These income-driven plans, you have to provide annual income documentation. If your income changes significantly, particularly decreases, you, you have to provide that income information sooner, right? Or you can, you don't have to, but it would help to lower your payment. Right, but they also might come with this ugly looking forgiveness at the end of it that may or may not be treated as taxable income, right? So they're a lot more confusing uh, to navigate, not only in the short term, particularly project in the long term to try to figure out, well, how much is this going to cost me and which one should I choose, right? And that's where we've spent a lot of time over the last 10 years or so trying to build some tools through VIN and VIN Foundation to help answer those questions. Right, so take your student loan balance, your career trajectory, your income, your changes in family size, changes to your circumstances, and see if that fits more in an income-driven strategy or if a time-driven strategy might benefit you more. When it comes to paying back your loans quickly, right? So that's you know I, I get that, and everybody wants to you know get rid of that student debt as fast as they can. Uh, but in most cases, the only way to do that, quote, quickly is to pay a bunch of money towards your student loans, right? And for most of us, we're not operating with unlimited resources, right? So at some point, you have to take a look at that and say, does it make sense for me to throw 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 percent of my income towards my student loans because I'm ultimately sacrificing other areas of my financial wellness that quite frankly, you can't afford to do, right? You kind of need that time to contribute to things like emergency funds, rich savings, tax advantage, retirement savings, buying a home sooner rather than later, if you want to start a family sooner rather than later. Those can be difficult things to do when we're trying to more quickly 
eliminate a student loan balance, right? So, and the good news is you don't have to, right? You can choose to pay less if your income will have you paying less under one of these income-driven plans as long as you're comfortable with what that means. Now, these have changed and they've changed over time. They're changing again, right? So just a little bit of caution, it's gonna get a little slippery here, right? So revised pay as you earn, got updated to saving on a valuable education or otherwise known as save that happened a couple of weeks ago officially. Save is going to have the lowest payment of any of the income driven plans, right? So it doesn't mean you should automatically use it, right? But it will generate the lowest monthly payment of any of the income driven plans just based on how the, the payment is calculated. I'll show you that in just a second. As part of these changes, they're going to phase out pay as you earn, which I told you earlier was one of the most beneficial of all of the income driven plans for veterinarians. Now, the good news is anybody who's using it can keep using it or anybody who's eligible to use it still has between now and July 1st of 2024 to choose it. But after that date, if you're not in pay as you earn, even if you're eligible for it, you won't be able to get into it, right? They're gonna phase out that plan and they're going to try to, you know, essentially push everybody into save or this newer version of IBR, right? Now the old version of IBR will still live out there, right? But it's, it's not gonna be very useful, right? It, it is essentially obsolete with the release of save, right? So the old, anybody that's on the old version of IBR is going to wanna look into this new save plan, do that physical exam of your student loans, see the next time you're due to renew. And when you are, think about choosing save. Right, or you want to compare what your current old IBR payment is right now to what it would be under save right now, and maybe even switch sooner. Right, but after after that kind of next renewal, everybody gets past this. You know, next time they're due to renew, there's not really going to be a good reason for anybody to be left in the old version of IBR. Right, but you have to choose to move. Right, they're not going to move you automatically. The only ones that get moved automatically or anyone who was using repay, which became save, right? Anybody that was using repay will be automatically put or converted into the new save repayment plan. But if you're sitting on the old version of IBR, you're gonna have to opt in to the new version of save, which means you're gonna have to switch plans at some point. For anyone who's eligible for the new version of IBR, right? So this is more recent graduates, um, you've got an even more interesting potential strategy. So one of the biggest downfalls of losing pay in favor of save is that pay as you earn allows you to reach forgiveness after 20 years of making qualifying payments, even if you have graduate school loans. For anybody that has graduate school loans that is using save, you have to navigate repayment for 25 years. Right, so there's an extra five years of payments associated with save, even though the payments are lower and it comes with that fancy unpaid interest subsidy, right? Now, for some people, that's going to make more sense. For others, it's not, right? And for those that have access to pay as you earn, they can still reach forgiveness at 20 years. For those that have access to IBR 2014, they still have access to forgiveness after 20 years. Right, but everybody else is kind of stuck with that 25 years. Now that does open up the potential for you to use save for, and, and this is part of the weed that we'll get into later, you can use save for a maximum of five years if you wanna then switch to this new version of IBR and receive forgiveness after 20 years. And that may, some of you, and this is where it comes to, into uploading your student aid data file in here and seeing if you're even eligible for this new version of IBR. Right? Many of you that have already graduated vet school and gone through your residency training and are, you know, large animal internal medicine practitioners may not be eligible for the new version of I, IBR, but you may see some of your colleagues behind you that are, right? And this is going to be an excellent option for those that are going through internship, residency, and then specialty, right? Is to use SAVE during that internship residency period and then switch to the new version of IBR when they're done with that training and hit forgiveness at 20 years, right? That's gonna be a really financially beneficial opportunity, particularly for those specialists who have kind of that 
four year, five year advanced education track. Right, because SAVE is going to cover all of their interest while they're otherwise making no money as an intern and resident, which will keep their loan balance from growing. And when they finish that specialty training, even when their income jumps significantly, they'll have logged four or five years of qualifying forgiveness time, which makes it quite likely that they'll still reach forgiveness under the new version of IBR when they hit that 20 years of payment. All right, so that's one you want to put in your back pocket for those of you that are kind of mentors or responsible for uh, residency programs, right? So that's something to put on the radar for, for our recent graduate colleagues who are doing that, that specialty training. Or if you're eligible for the new version of IBR yourself, you can put a pin in that one too, because that's still, that's still a very good repayment strategy for those folks as well. Public service loan forgiveness, it's not actually on this repayment option list because it's not a repayment plan. Right, it's a benefit that you might qualify for if you do all the right things, right? And one of those right things is using an income-driven plan, right? So you have to pay your loans under an income-driven plan while working for a qualifying employer. So that's the overlap between public service loan forgiveness and the income-driven plans. Okay, so let's spend some time talking about how they calculate your payment, right? So they use what's called the discretionary income. Now, discretionary income can be a little bit different depending on the plan that you choose, but the concept is the same. They're going to take your taxable income, they're going to subtract off some allowance, right? And the allowance is going to be based on the plan that you choose, right? So it's either going to be 150% or 225% of the federal poverty guidelines. And so that's essentially the fudge factor they use to account for everybody's, let's call it essential living expenses. Right, so they'll take your taxable income, subtract off that allowance, that's your discretionary income. And then we're going to take some percentage of that, depending on the plan, to calculate your monthly payment. All right, so this new version of SAVE uses the higher allowance, so 225% of the federal poverty guidelines. Then they're going to multiply that discretionary income of something between five and 10%. For most of us veterinarians, it's going to be 10% because this is a sliding scale based on your proportion of undergraduate student loan balance to graduate school student loan balance, right? And for those of us that have gone through veterinary school, that veterinary school balance dwarfs our undergraduate balance. We may see some people kind of float down near that 9% but it's probably not gonna get much lower than that for any veterinarian, right? So we're just gonna assume it's 10%. If it's a little bit less than that, then congratulations. 10% uh, will be for pay as you earn or the new version of IBR, 15% for the old version of IBR. This is essentially why this old version of IBR is obsolete, right? That payment's always gonna be significantly higher than it would be for save. So there's not really a good reason to choose that old version of IBR over the new version of save. So if we do an example, let's say $125,000 of income, we subtract off 2.25 times the federal poverty guidelines. This is for a family size of one in the lower 48 states. Discretionary income is 92,000. I'm gonna take 10% of that divided by 12. My minimum monthly payment, my income requires me in this case to pay $768 per month. All right, so compare that again against the $2,100 that that $200,000 student loan balance requires you to pay to extinguish it in 10 years, right? That's a significant difference, right? So that's what I'm looking for. That's the kind of that back of the napkin exercise where we should all be going through, right? What's my most recent taxable income show? If I run it through this calculation, what will that monthly payment be? How does that stack up against what my loan servicer says my monthly payment's gonna be on October, right? Or how does that stack up against some other strategy that I might want to take to pay my loans back. All right. So for anybody that always, you know, that wants to say, well, I'm going to, I want to pay my loans back as fast as possible. Okay. Well, what does that mean? All right. How fast is fast? All right. How many years? All right. And then we can kind of work our way backwards. Let, let's say that's 10 years. All right. I can calculate what my monthly payment needs to be based on my loan balance and interest rate in order to pay that balance to zero in 10 years. Right, well, how does that stack up against what my income requires me to pay? If there's a significant difference there, then I'm going to choose this instead. Right, because I want access to that extra cash flow so I can start saving for retirement, save for the down payment on a home, buy a practice, buy equipment, 
I, you know, start a family. I do other things that are generally going to have a higher return on that investment than maybe paying extra towards my student loans. I guess the reality is my student loans aren't going to prevent me from doing anything. Right? The only thing I'm choosing here is the difference between my repayment options. Right? I'm either going to pay what my income requires me to pay and I'm going to hit forgiveness, in which case I may or may not have to pay a tax, or my income is high enough where the monthly payment will actually extinguish that balance before I hit forgiveness. In either scenario, my student loans are gone. Right? So they're kind of a temporary issue, if you will. Right? Now, we all, we all want to turn them into a bigger issue than they are. Right, but financially, this is kind of a temporary situation, right? So it really is up to you in terms of how you choose to approach that and what impact that's going to have on your overall finances, right? So how much you should pay on your student loans? I look at your income. I look at your income. I look at your family size. I look at the state that you live in, right? Because we're, as we're going to talk about a little bit later, if you're married and you live in a community property state and you file your taxes separately, you're going to have a really complicated circumstance, right? But you can also have a very otherwise beneficial monthly student loan payment, right? And, and I think a lot of us also kind of discount how much our income needs to be to generate an appreciable student loan payment under these newer plans, right? So, you know, commonly people tell me, well, I'm going to pay $1,500 a month towards my student loans. Okay, that's cool. But if you're not making at over $200,000 a year, your income doesn't require you to do that. Right now, some of you might be, or you will be, right? particularly specialists, right? But don't pay your student loans like you're earning $200,000 a year until you're actually earning $200,000 a year, right? So that's kind of what those income-driven plans show us, is we have, in many cases, some significant cash flow opportunity to tap into just by how we choose to pay back our student loans. Right now, when we get up into these higher income ranges, it kind of depends on where are we in the loan repayment timeframe? How much longer do I have until I hit forgiveness? Right, Because sometimes it's not gonna make sense for me to pay above what my income requires me to pay because I'm still probably going to hit forgiveness even with a few years of higher monthly payments. Right. So, but again, either way, either scenario, your student loans are zero. Right. So I kind of let my income determine what that monthly payment should be. So, and this was somebody who asked, asked that, a similar question to that in their, in their submission for the registration today. Right. Am I eligible for savings? Well, do the math. Right. Look at the payment plan that you're currently using. Look at the payment plans you're eligible for. What's your most recent? tax return show for your adjusted gross income, what is 10% of your discretionary income? How does that monthly payment stack up to what you're either currently paying or your loan servicer says you should be paying? All right, so you probably are eligible for savings, right? particularly with the re release of the new save plan. All right, so income-driven plans, forgiveness, there's two different types of forgiveness. There's public service loan forgiveness and there's income-driven plan forgiveness. These are two separate concepts. I find people kind of stumble across these all the time. We, we wrote a blog post on this uh, a few years back and we try to keep this up to date, but student loan forgiveness can be taxable or tax-free. It depends on what the law is for treating student loan forgiveness or whether or not you reach public service loan forgiveness. Public service loan forgiveness is always non-taxable. That is baked into the law, right? If you are working for a nonprofit, making payments to direct loans on uh, using an income-driven repayment plan, and you do that for 10 years, any amount that you have remaining will be forgiven and you do not have to pay tax on it. Now, income-driven plans are a little bit fuzzier, right? So forgiven amounts are usually treated as taxable income, right, in general, right? However, there is a a law in place right now that was part of the uh, law that created the pandemic forbearance benefits, um, the CARES Act, which exempted any kind of student loan forgiveness from being treated as taxable under federal tax law between 2021 and 2025. And we may see that extended beyond 2025. It kind of remains to be seen. Right, but right now, anybody who receives any kind of student loan forgiveness 
through the 2025 tax year will not have to pay federal income tax on that. Now, there are some states that are still going to treat that forgiveness as taxable income, but state tax rates are much lower than federal income tax rates, and right? it's only a handful of states that might tax that. Right, so we are seeing that pop up right now with people who are receiving forgiveness under the one-time forgiveness count adjustment. Right, thankfully they're not going to have to pay any federal student or uh, um, federal income tax, but they might have to a small chance they'll have to pay a state income tax depending on the state that they live in, and that will be the case through 2025. Otherwise, right, so if you're not working towards public service loan forgiveness, or you're not going to receive forgiveness between now and 2025, then I would encourage you to put planning for that tax in your financial plan, right? And that's that's what I do, right? So, I mean, I'm going to hit forgiveness in 2037, right? It's, it may not be tax-free, right? It's gonna be under income-driven plan forgiveness. So I am actively planning as if I will have to pay that tax. If I don't, what a bonus, right? If I do, I'm prepared. And my plan is to be over-prepared right? because I don't know exactly what that tax is going to be, but I know that I've had, you know, 25 years to plan for it, right? It gives me a lot of wiggle room. And the longer that I use that time to my advantage to plan for it, the lower it's actually going to cost me to stay for that tax, right? Because I can use that power of compound interest in my favor to reduce the amount that I actually contribute in my own funds to cover that tax down the down the line. And right? so I, I see I see a lot of people in the, you know, unfortunately the terminology is the terminology. And for whatever reason, people have kind of settled on tax bomb, which sounds really scary. And it really makes people kind of avoid these income driven plans because they fear having to pay a big tax down the down the road. However, the tax ends up being a huge discount, right? Because if you think about what the top federal income tax brackets are, right? Right now, that top tax bracket is 37%, right? So my worst case scenario is that I pay 37 cents on the dollar of whatever is remaining of my student loan balance. And for most of us, it's going to be something less than that, right? Because that, that um, the amount of income you have to show to trigger that top tax bracket is quite high, right? And even in and, and some of us might hit that top top tax bracket when we factor in our forgiven amount, but it doesn't mean the entire amount is taxed at that rate. It's only the amount that falls into that portion of that particular tax bracket, right? So it's probably going to be something less than 37%, which means I've got a 63% discount on my remaining student loan balance, right? So in reality, Anything that hits forgiveness under an income-driven plan, even if you have to pay a tax on it, is a huge discount, right? In public service loan forgiveness, you get a 100% discount, right? So that is, that is, you know, that's the benefit of public service loan forgiveness. And anybody that, the people that want to pay their loans back quickly, or the folks that say, I want to pay, you know, as little interest as possible or pay back even less than I borrowed, public service loan forgiveness, right? Public service loan forgiveness will reliably produce those projections where we see people paying significantly less than even what they borrowed to pay for veterinary school. Right? So if you have any kind of career opportunity that might lead you down public service loan forgiveness and you've got student loans that you want to get rid of sooner rather than later, then public service loan forgiveness is for you. All right. So I see a question here. Thank you for the great information. Just a little comment. I think the loan formula calculates discretionary income based on AGI and unfortunately not the taxable income. Taxable income is AGI less standard or itemized deduction. Yeah, that's so that's a great and thanks. I, I know I, th I think I've, I've got an email in my inbox from you. Um, I, I believe you're a financial planner. So yeah, so thanks for that clarification. Um, so the law says taxable income and what they what they mean, and I, I totally get where you're coming from in, in terms of what it, how it reads on the on the tax return. They will use your accept your adjusted gross income all of the time. Right now, if you don't use your adjusted gross income, they will accept your quote taxable income, which is your gross income less all of those 
pre-tax deductions you may have, which is why I use that terminology, right? So you have an opportunity if you don't use your adjusted gross income to use an alternative documentation of your income. And when you provide that alternative documentation of income, rather than providing your gross income, if you provide them income documentation that shows your gross income less any pre-tax items you may have, like health insurance premiums, HSA contributions, traditional 401k contributions, things like that, it will subtract off that amount to get to what I call your taxable income, right? Which ultimately will show as your AGI and your tax return, right? But that's there's a kind of a, a loose play in how they use that terminology in the student loan world and the, the and the words that are actually on your tax return. So yeah, thanks for thanks for that clarification. But yeah, and that's that's kind of what I mean by that um, that particular term there. So you have that option of choosing between your AGI, that is a number specifically from your most recently filed tax return. They'll always accept that. But if for some reason that number is higher than your current quote, taxable income, you can provide that alternative documentation of income instead. What happens if you work overseas? Yeah, that's a that's another great question, one that comes up pretty commonly. So if you live and work overseas, uh, depending on how much income you earn, your AGI, your adjusted gross income, is sometimes or often zero, right? Because there's a foreign exclude, uh, exclusion, foreign income exclusion on taxable income. So you don't end up paying double taxes, right? Depending on where you live and work, how, how long you live and work overseas. When you file a tax return living and working overseas, your US tax return AGI can be very low, if not zero, right? And you can use that to satisfy that discretionary income calculation, which means you can have a very low, if not zero monthly payment on your student loans while you live and work overseas. Right now, if you don't make any payments, towards your loans for 20 or 25 years and you hit forgiveness, right? You quite possibly are going to trigger some kind of taxable event, even though you don't live in the US at that time, right? So you're still gonna need to plan for that potential tax down the road if, you, um, if you're living and working overseas uh, for that duration long enough to reach student loan forgiveness. And I did see, um, and I think maybe you're still, you're maybe the person that asked the question too, about public service loan forgiveness if you work for an AVMA accredited institution overseas. Now, unfortunately, and that's where we're kind of on the public service loan forgiveness instead of slide here, right? So that is going to, you have to be working for a 501c3 nonprofit, right? And unfortunately, that is only a designation that's extended to entities that are part, or are created in, 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 uh, in the US, right? So while those, Academic institutions overseas may be some form of nonprofit. They don't, they're not, they don't really fall under the nonprofit universe as governed by the IRS in the US. Right. So I don't believe you're going to be able to get public service loan forgiveness credit uh, working for an academic institution overseas. But any of the veterinary academic institutions that are in the US would fall under the public service loan forgiveness guidelines. Right. And the guidelines here are direct loans, right? So all of your loans have to be direct loans. So coming back to that student loan physical exam, I'm looking at my loan types, right? I've got all direct loans remaining, 100% of my balance. I know that they check that box for public service loan forgiveness, right? I have to be using an income-driven plan, right? In order to qualify. If I don't, right, then I'm not going to meet the public service loan forgiveness guideline. Now, there's been a number of attempts over the years to make public service loan forgiveness more beneficial rather than less because a lot of people weren't doing the right things initially, right? They might've had direct loans. They weren't using the right repayment plan. So we have this temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness opportunity, right? So if you may have made some goofs over the years, I would highly recommend that you submit some kind of uh, public service loan forgiveness employment certification form to see if you can get a second crack at documenting some of that time that may not have been eligible previously, right? And then the third pillar, right, is making sure that you are working at least 30 hours per week with a qualifying employer, right? A nonprofit 501c3, ideally, as documented in the public service loan forgiveness um, guidelines. I was told by my lender 
that when I consolidate all of my subsidized loans together and unsubsidized loans together, I started back at zero payments towards my forgiveness. Is this true? It is not true. Not right now, right? So it used to be the case, right? So it depends on when you consolidate it, right? So um, ever since, or it actually doesn't really even matter now when you consolidate it. Um, during this one, this special one-time count adjustment, you will get forgiveness credit for anything they find that's repayment time in your history, right? This was at 2019. So yes, in 2019, at the time you consolidated in 2019, if you consolidate, I'm not sure if that scares you away from consolidation or not, but at in 2019, if you were to consolidate your loans, it would restart your clock, your forgiveness clock, right? However, I think it was April 2022 is when the one-time forgiveness count adjustment was announced. Any prior repayment time going back to 1994, whether you consolidated or not, would be counted as forgiveness eligible. I did consolidate. Okay, great. So if you have all consolidation loans remaining, you are going to have all of your loans considered for the one-time count adjustment, right? So the maximum number of repayment months or years that you have on any of your loans that were included in that consolidation will determine how much forgiveness eligible time you have. And if you have been working for public service loan forgiveness at any time since you graduated or consolidated or started working, then I would also recommend you submit a public service loan forgiveness employment certification form. They will go back and give you time credit for that time, even on loans from before when you consolidated under this special one-time forgiveness count adjustment. All right, so yes, it used to be that consolidation would restart your forgiveness clock, but all of that has been undone, if you will. All right, so it's been, it's been a tough road to try to get people, because I've been telling people for the last 10 years, don't consolidate because it's gonna restart your clock, right? In some cases it still made sense, but in other cases or most cases it didn't, but now, it does, again, right? Because you have this opportunity to increase your forgiveness qualifying time, right? And going forward, even after this year, rather than restart your clock, when you consolidate, they're gonna calculate a weighted average, right? But the weighted average is always gonna be lower than the current benefit, which will kind of give you the maximum forgiveness time based on the loan that is in that consolidation that has the longest repayment history. Right, so right now and through the end of the year is the most beneficial time ever to consolidate. And if you've already consolidated like you did in 2019, you'll already stand, you're already in line to receive that maximum count adjustment when they apply that in 2024. Cool, so good questions. Yep, that's exactly the kind of stuff we're kind of looking for here to help you work through while you're, um, you know, while you're kind of analyzing your student loan. Can you talk a minute about, um, since I know we probably have some borrowers that have been in repayment for some period of time, about those that may need to go ahead and consolidate again, even though they may have consolidated previously? Yeah, so that, that's going to depend on whether or not you consolidated all of your loans, right, or if you have some of these older FELL program loans. All right, so this kind of gets into the weeds of the history of the student loan repayment system. But I, you know, we get questions all the time on the student debt message board, whereas, you know, well, I consolidated my loans 10, 15, 20 years ago. Well, you may have, but you may have ended up with a, a FELL consolidation loan, a federal family education loan, right? That's an older loan that isn't eligible for public service loan forgiveness, right? It's not a direct loan, but you can consolidate those into a direct consolidation loan. And if you do so by the end of the year, you'll still get credit for all of that past repayment time. And that's how a lot of people are, and that's under the one-time count adjustment, which we haven't technically gotten to yet. People are receiving forgiveness that have been in repayment for 25 years, our, our veterinary colleagues are, right? Even if they had those older loans because they consolidated them into a direct validation loan, they're getting retroactive credit for all of that repayment time. And those that have eclipsed 25 years are receiving forgiveness right now. Right, so that's the one-time forgiveness count adjustment, which is separate, again, from public service loan forgiveness. That same thing exists, right? If you, like in this example I was showing here, right? We've got loans with differing amounts. This is why I show this example because this one's the most obvious, 
And I can see I've got different amounts here. Some of these loans were consolidated, most not, right? But I can consolidate this already consolidated loans with these unconsolidated loans and the new consolidation loan will receive this 96 months of forgiveness credit in terms of public service loan forgiveness, right? That's how the one-time forgiveness count adjustment works. Generally speaking, if you're gonna to work towards public service loan forgiveness, you want to, again, consolidate if necessary, if it'll help to maximize the amount of your loans that's forgiven or qualified for public service loan forgiveness. Ultimately gonna to wanna to use save at some point, maybe not right now, especially if you've got a very beneficial monthly payment under a different plan, you can keep that until you're next due to renew. But at some point you probably wanna to switch to save because it's gonna generate a lower monthly payment. Right? And when you think about public service loan forgiveness, the ultimate goal is to have the maximum amount forgiven, right? So use save, right? Use, use the save plan because it's gonna generate the lowest monthly payment. If you're married, file your taxes separately from your spouse, you may end up paying extra. You probably will end up paying a little extra in taxes and you'll lose some benefits, but depending on your circumstances, you're gonna save a significant amount in monthly student loan payments, right? So investigate filing those taxes separately. I'd right, submit that employment certification annually. You don't have to, but I would encourage you to do so, right? Because if you don't, when you get to the 10 years where you can actually apply to have your loans forgiven, they're going to require some kind of log of time that you've spent working towards public service loan forgiveness. If you're submitting that employment certification form every year for nine, 10 years, that's going to be an easy exercise when you get to that 10th year. Right? It doesn't have to be consecutive. Right? You can break that up, but it's going to maximize the benefit if you hit it sooner rather than later. Right. And and I, you know, we we covered this last week during the academic session, but I am of the opinion that every internship residency at an acad veterinary academic institution should be eligible for public service loan forgiveness credit. Right. Now it depends on who you find to sign off on the form, but the rules are such that you should all meet the requirements as residents of those programs. Right, so eventually we'll get to that. That's kind of where the humans are and they've been there for a long time, right? But for some reason, you know, the veterinary programs are kind of kicking and screaming their way in there, right? So um, hopefully if you're in charge of one of these programs or know somebody who is, you can encourage them to help those folks document that progress even while they're doing their residency training. All right, what is the one-time opportunity that I keep hearing regarding public service loan forgiveness? Well. That, that depends, I, I might need a little bit more information, Brian, if you can provide it, but the one-time opportunity, there's been a number of one-time opportunities, right? The existing one that's currently ongoing is the one-time count adjustment. And that applies to public service loan forgiveness as well as income-driven plan forgiveness. There was previously a, what was called a limited waiver, public service loan forgiveness limited waiver, where pretty much anything you were doing with your student loans for a brief period of time would be considered public service loan forgiveness eligible as long as you were working for a 501c3 or other qualifying nonprofit, right? So as long as you consolidated your loans to make them otherwise eligible, they would go back in time, back to 2007, the earliest time when public service loan forgiveness was actually written into law to receive additional public service loan forgiveness credit. Right. And then there's also a temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness provision, which is still in place, right? which kind of does the same thing, but it is not as encompassing as the limited waiver was under public service loan forgiveness. But that has since expired. Now, there's a lot of overlap between what the limited waiver did and the one time forgiveness count adjustment. Right? But it's not as all encompassing as the limited waiver was. Right, so if you have been working for a qualifying nonprofit and you didn't receive credit for it, there could be a way for you to get credit for it, depending on what your student loan look like, what you've done with those student loans or what you could do with those student loans before the end of the year. Right, and some of these, and this is where, I've got another example here I wanna go through. I didn't get a chance to do this one. 
last week. But this this one just kind of illustrates this. And I know there's a lot of overlap in, in the in the specialty world between academia and, and private practice um, in terms of going maybe back and forth, you know, either towards private practice or from private practice back to academia. And I, you know, I this is something that comes up not infrequently, right, on the student debt message boards, where it's like, oh, I've been in repayment for five years and I got this awesome opportunity to work uh, for a nonprofit and tell me about public service loan forgiveness. And that's kind of what this case represents. And, you know, they've been hammering their loans for a good number of years. And there's a there's actually some loans that have been paid in full, right? $43,000 of loans that were paid in full, right? That could have been forgiven under public service loan forgiveness now that they're in a qualifying employment position. Right, so it's just another one of those cases that just illustrates there's really not a great reason to accelerate your federal student loan repayment. Right, you'd never know where your career may take you. Right, based on the monthly payment that this person has on their old IBR program with their remaining student loans, their income really never justified paying this chunk of balance off early. Right, so. But they did, right? And because they did that before the pandemic forbearance benefits started, they can't request a refund of those payments, right? So some of these things you can't undo, right? There's been some really special opportunity over the last few years for you to undo some of the common mistakes that have been made in student loan repayment. But some of these things are not on, you know, can't be undone, right? And there's just not a lot of incentive. It's like you didn't really gain a whole lot of ground here by paying that balance off sooner, right? The, the payment's still the same, right? Whether you have, in this case, $132,000 of student loans or $173,000 of student loans, the payment's still the same, right? So you don't really gain anything by paying more than your income requires towards your student, your federal student loans. And you never know when you might end up in a position to either receive forgiveness sooner or potentially receive public service loan forgiveness. So again, that's where I always am kind of leaning towards that, you know, pay what your income requires, right? And if your income's high enough for long enough to pay the balance to zero, great. If not, you've got way better things to do with your money, right? So there's not a lot of incentive for you to rush to pay back those student loans. All right, so here's another, and it's not as dramatic as the last example, right? But we've got some of our loans that have 15 months of qualifying public service loan forgiveness time and, and another loan that has 14 months. Now that could just be an accounting goof or it, there could be some reason for it. But if they consolidated all of these loans, they would receive that 15 months of qualifying credit under that public service loan forgiveness plan. All right, any other questions on public service loan forgiveness? I just wanted to show, share this one. This is a rather dramatic example, right? This is somebody who received public service loan forgiveness under the temporary expanded PSLF guidelines, right? So it wasn't necessarily doing all of the right things originally, but got a second crack at it and had all of their loan, $430,000 of loans wiped out to zero, didn't have to pay tax on, right? Really dramatic, right? That's, those are life-changing events, right? As long as you're following along and knowing what the options are, you can have those loans eliminated sooner rather than later as well. All right, so this is kind of why I, I do this, right? Um, you know, I'm, 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 it's kind of like those, the hair club for many things, right? I'm not only a, a you know, salesman, I'm, a, I'm, I'm doing it myself, right? So, and I don't get anything from the Department of Education by plugging the income driven plans, right? It's just that people generally don't understand them, right? And I didn't understand them when we first started them. And it was almost, you know, I, I hear this a lot. It's too, it looks, it reads too good to be true, so it probably is. Well, if you don't pursue it, then you won't get it, right? And that's really what we've seen, right? People who tend to write it off or ignore it don't get it, right? The people who actually tune in and pay attention are seeing their loans forgiven, right? So, you know, it's up to you, right? But there is some huge benefit using them, right? So I'm a veterinarian. My wife is a specialist. You know, we've we've made a lot of mistakes with our student loans. We've also learned a lot of how better to handle them. And we've kind of translated that into all of the uh, help that we provide through VIN and VIN Foundation, helping thousands of our veterinary colleagues understand their student loans and their repayment options a little bit better, right? And we, we learn from you all as well, right? That's where we get a lot of this information to then 
put into these presentations so you have a better idea of what to do with your unique career path through veterinary medicine, right? But combined, we have an excess of $400,000 in our student loans. So if we wanted to pay it back, quote, fast, we would have had to have paid $4,500 a month, right? Which wasn't going to happen, right? We weren't even earning that. We had to look at some other option, right? So income-driven plans, right? We started out with the old version of IBR. We switched to repay when it became available. Now repay got switched to save, right? So we'll automatically get switched to save, right? We had the pandemic forbearance benefits, which nobody saw coming, which gave us more than three years of forgiveness credit without having to make any payments or see our interest accrue, right? So it automatically reduced the amount that I'm gonna to pay towards my student loans without having to do anything, right? So other than just keep my loans in the federal system. Now we're gonna see save, right? Save is gonna be kind of that next iteration, right? It still is going to ultimately end up in student loan forgiveness, which may or may not be taxable. But I know I now know that I will never have more than what my student loan balance is now forgiven if I'm using save. Right before it was really kind of a crapshoot. It depended on 20 and 25 years of earning history, how much you paid, what your unpaid interest balance was. It was a little bit difficult to understand what would be the amount that is forgiven and how much tax am I gonna have to pay? Now with save and the 100% unpaid interest subsidy that's on there, the amount that's going to be forgiven is capped at whatever my student balance is right now, right? Because I know I will never see my unpaid interest balance grow anymore if I use save, right? So that's helpful in terms of planning if I have to pay the tax and I'm currently doing that, right? And we're 80% of our way to hitting our projected tax target with about 14 years before we actually hit forgiveness, right? And I use a, you know, a, a, it's, called, it's a robo-advising platform called Wealthfront. I mean, these are dozens of these out there nowadays. Uh, it's never been easier to invest on your own, right? And if you have, if you're comfortable doing this stuff, you can do this, right? But I, I've been doing this with my forgiveness savings plan for nearly 10 years now. There are a little bit less than that. And the dotted line represents how much I've contributed, which includes the dividends. And the solid line is the value of that fund, right? So the more this gap increases, the less of my own money is going to go towards covering that tax, which means I'm reducing my total loan repayment costs through my forgiveness plan, presuming I have to pay that tax at the end. And if I don't, well, now I've got this fund that I can use for whatever else I choose. So that's how we, that's how we do it. Um, you know, that's if you're not heading for public service loan forgiveness, you don't necessarily have to plan for that tax if you're working towards public service loan forgiveness. Although I do see a lot of people who want to anyway for like a peace of mind kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, that's totally up to you, right? Public service loan forgiveness, again, there's no, there's no scenario where you're paying a tax if you reach public service loan forgiveness, right? So it's really up to whether or not you're going to complete the requirements to reach public service loan forgiveness. It's not so much whether or not they're gonna change the rules on public service loan forgiveness. Okay, so let's talk about some of these changes here, right? So here's kind of the formal information on save, right? We've, got, we've kind of covered this through a lot of those examples, uh, but I wanted to just lay it out here, another chance for you to see it. Also, it gives me a chance to kind of dive into that one-time count adjustment in a little more detail as well. Uh, one of the big benefits of save that you didn't have with repay, one of the things that kept people from using repay, particularly married folks, was that even if you filed your taxes separately, they still wanted to see your spouse's income if you were using repay. Right now, that conversion to save now allows you that option of excluding your spouse's income if your most recently filed tax return is separate. Right. So if you file your taxes separately, then you can exclude your spouse's income from the save calculation, right? So that's another bonus of that save plan. You do have this opportunity if you're eligible to switch from save to IBR, the new version, IBR 2014, right? But you, you have to do that before you've logged 60 monthly payments and save, right? So the soonest that that, that count won't start officially until July 1st of 2024, 
right? So anybody that's using Save and planning to switch to IBR 2014, the soonest they're going to be able, or the latest that they're going to be able to do that is July 1st, 2029, in order to take advantage of that um, for anybody that's planning on that right now. They will phase out pay as you earn as well as ICR. ICR was a pretty crappy plan. Nobody was really using that unless you have parent plus loans. Um, pay as you earn is going to get phased out. Anybody that's not using it after July 1st will no longer be able to get into it. And if you switch away after that date, you won't be able to get back in. Okay, so the one-time count adjustment, any prior repayment time, even including certain deferment and forbearance time is forgiveness eligible. Time prior to the consolidation is also eligible for forgiveness credit, right? So we had that question about my loan servicer told me consolidation would reset my clock. Yes, that used to be the law, right? Right now, they are counting your prior repayment time as forgiveness eligible, even in consolidation. And if you have varying amounts of forgiveness time, they're going to give you the highest amount if you consolidate before the end of this year. The closer you get to forgiveness, the less you're going to pay, right? And the sooner your loans are going to be gone, gone. So I really wouldn't make any, when it comes to, you know, the people that are kind of sitting on the fence between do I do income driven repayment or do I pay my loans back as quickly as possible? I wouldn't get off that fence until I see what my account adjustment is, right? I want to know how close am I to forgiveness, right? When I can see that number in 2024 in my file, I mean, most of us should have a decent idea of what that is anyway, but those of us that have kind of a tortured path through higher education, it can be a little bit tougher to know, right? But I'm not going to make any major decisions on how much I should pay towards my student loans other than what my income requires until I see that count, right? I want to know how close or how far away I am from forgiveness before I make any major decisions on in that regard, right? And that kind of gets to this question that was asked about, you know, is it still true, right? Yeah, it's still true. Right? And we're seeing some people receive forgiveness right now because they've already eclipsed that 25 year threshold, but we'll see even more people get really close to forgiveness where they only have one, two, three, five years remaining of repayment until they hit that forgiveness finish line because of what their account adjustment shows. Right, So it would really be more beneficial to kind of wait to see what that forgiveness count is in 2024 before kind of making those major strategy changes. $39 billion have been canceled for more than 800,000 borrowers under this one-time count adjustment, right? This includes our veterinary colleagues. There's a number of them on the student debt message boards that have already received these letters that said that your student loans are forgiven. So how much longer until you reach forgiveness? That's kind of the big, the big open question that's out there right now. When it comes to your renewal dates, we kind of covered that through the examples that we've been illustrating. Nobody's been required to provide income documentation during the forbearance benefit period. Right? If you're using an income-driven plan, you'll have an anniversary date. The soonest anybody could be required to renew is six months after the payment pause end. So you're looking at somewhere in March of 2024. Right? If, you're in, if your renewal date doesn't show 2020, March 2024 or later, that is probably wrong. Right? So you want to check with your loan servicer and make sure they know and you know when you're next due to provide that income documentation. But nobody has to provide that income documentation now unless it will actually result in a lower monthly payment for you. Right? And that's kind of what I'm working through with my loan servicer right now. They did that automatic conversion and my payment under repay or under the new save is exactly the same as it was under repay, which can't be. Right, just based on how the math works for the calculation between save and repay, the save payment is always lower. So it can't it can't be correct that my payment would be the same as it was before under the new plan. So that's the part, that's what I'm working through with my loan servicer now. The easiest way to apply to have your payment recalculated is studentaid.gov. Right, so Kind of back to the discussion about taxable income and AGI, it's always easiest to use studentaid.gov electronically. You can go back and retrieve your most recent tax return, and it'll pull the AGI number right off the tax return, right? And they'll always take that, no matter what that number is, right? But if your current income is less than what that AGI shows for any reason, 
right? That's where that alternative documentation of income comes in, right? And when you have to provide alternative documentation of income, you normally have to write that out and submit it to your loan servicer. There used to be a way where you can just type it into a box, but that's gone too, right? So the alternative documentation of your income, you know, a lot of people just submit a pay stub, right? But you got to be really careful of that because you never know what your loan servicer is going to do with that pay stub, right? You have to make sure that it's clear what your pay frequency is. You don't want them just calculating it based on your gross income. You want to subtract off any of those, you know, allowable pre-tax deductions from that pay stub as well. So when I use that, I use that alternative documentation of income method. I open up a Word document, calculate out what the payment should be, provide the pay stub as supporting income information, but I calculate what the payment should be, accounting for my pre-tax deductions, my wife's student loans, and the discretionary income calculation. Right? So if they come back with a different number than what is shown on that document, I've got something to call them and ask them about. Right, so I do that whenever I need to renew my income information. All right. Um, I see a question in there about public service loan forgiveness. I'm going to come back to that one in just a little bit. All right, so repayment strategy is kind of the home stretch here. The best is not always the fastest. The fastest is not always the cheapest. So should I pay off loans as fast as possible versus going for forgiveness? It really depends. What does that as fast as possible payment look like versus what does your income require you to pay? If there's a significant difference there, then don't pay them off as fast as possible, right? There's probably other things that you can do better with that additional cash flow that are going to yield a higher return on that investment, right? You're going to get rid of your student loans one way or another, right? And I kind of challenge everybody recently, you know, what happens if you don't pay your student loans off fast enough? Right. I, I, you know, I can't, there's, there's not like, the, I mean, other than these kind of mental torment that we put ourselves through, right? There's not anything external that happens to us because we have a student loan balance, right? Most of it is what we do to ourselves, right? So, you know, if you can remove that part, which is very hard to do, right? And kind of turn it into a more objective exercise of how much is my income requiring me to pay? What does it look like for how long? What else can I do? in my financial wellness planning, that's going to yield better results, right? That's a better way to look at it, right? If you just hyper-focus on that 200, 300, $400,000 balance and say, oh my God, right? That's when I see people doing a lot of weird things that don't make a lot of financial sense. So I'm looking at it again, objectively, I'm trying to reduce the risk to myself and my family, right? My student loans, right? I don't, I, if something happens to me, if I walk out my front door, I get hit by a bus, my wife, my daughter are never responsible for my federal student loan. They go away with me, right? If I refinance my federal student loans into a private loan or other private loans that I have, that's not the case, right? There's usually a co-signer on those, right? Somebody else is responsible for that. So I have to plan for that as well, right? I also know with my federal student loans, if I have a decrease in my income for any reason, and I take time off to have a family. You know, I'm taking time off to, you know, help an elderly family member, um, switching jobs. Whatever the case is, I can have my payment lowered to reflect whatever my change in income is. Right? And with the new save plan, my loan balance won't grow. Right? So I have all these flexible options of dealing with that rather large expense that is my student loans that help to preserve my cash flow and keep me on track for my other financial planning items. And then sometimes it'll reduce my total repayment costs many times. You know, when it comes to public service loan forgiveness, it always will. Uh, when it comes to anybody who's starting with a debt to income ratio greater than two, it, it probably always will as well, right? So there's kind of rules of thumb that we have seen from running thousands and thousands of simulations for our colleagues that tend to float to the top, right? But reducing the total cost is not really my first priority, right? It's these two are way bigger in my opinion. Right, so oftentimes I'll get all three together, which makes it a no-brainer, right? But even if I can't get this last one, as long as it's not significantly different, in which case, in many cases, it never is, right? These two are always worth more than this, this last one. And this is where those debt income ratio guidelines are, right? So for those of you that are kind of struggling with this, or maybe this is your first exposure to repayment because the, you know, We've been in the pandemic forbearance benefit period for nearly four years, right? These are some of the guidelines that I use, right? So if you're starting repayment 
with a debt to income ratio that's less than one, you're quite likely going to pay that balance to zero before you reach any kind of forgiveness, maybe even public service loan forgiveness. Right? You, ha you, you're, you have to have a balance left to forgive under public service loan forgiveness. And when your debt to income ratio is less than one, your, your payment under an income driven plan is fairly close to what it would be under a standard 10 year plan. Right, so you might not reach public service loan forgiveness, but it also means you'll pay your loans to zero in something close to 10 years, right? which, is, which is not a bad thing. If you're starting greater than two, then it's quite likely that you're gonna hit forgiveness, particularly under the newer plans like save and having the ability to switch from save to new version of IBR. Right? No matter what your income does in the future or how fast it grows, right, you are still likely to hit forgiveness. Right, so in these cases, if my starting debt income ratio is less than one, if it were my dog, right, I'm gonna pay using save, pay the minimum until my income gets to a point where it's going to accelerate my student loan payment. If I'm using save, I can actually have a payment that's greater than a standard 10 year plan, right? But it's still always 10% of my discretionary income. So it's a reasonable payment compared to what my monthly household finances are. Right, so I'm gonna use that as my guide. Right, and when might my debt to income ratio be less than one? For some of us, it'll be never, right? But if, in, if it is, when might that happen? How long am I in repayment? How much longer do I have until I hit forgiveness? Right, if my debt to income ratio is less than, or greater than one, right, I'm going to start out with save probably, right? Unless I'm not eligible for the new version of IBR, in which case I might use page earn if I'm eligible for that because it'll make more sense for me to hit forgiveness sooner. If I'm not eligible for page earn, then I'm gonna stick with save. All right, so we've got kind of these flows that we can use to start thinking about what we should generally be doing with our student loans and then kind of confirm that with our student loan physical exam and keep monitoring that as we have, have changes to our circumstances. All right, for those of you that are kind of overseeing some of these, uh, and, and, so, and there was a few of you that asked questions about better understanding student and resident concerns. These are things that I hope we can all just encourage our colleagues not to do going forward, right? Deferment is bad, right? So while you're in school, there's nothing you can do about it, right? Your loans are automatically deferred while you're in school and still borrowing. But once you're done with school, don't ever request or let your loan servicer put your loans into deferment again, right? Deferment doesn't count towards forgiveness. It will have your interest grow and then add to your principal when that deferment is over, called capitalization. Right? Better to use an income-driven plan, pay what your income requires, which won't be very much, if anything. If you're using save, there won't be any unpaid interest that accrues. And when your income does increase, any unpaid interest you have will not get added to your principal. Right? Deferment is a is a no-no, right? It, it's kind of was that reflex reaction for everybody who did advanced training, but it's obsolete. The income-driven plans have made deferment obsolete. Right? So colleagues don't let other colleagues defer their loans. There is, and this kind of relates to the question uh, that's in the in the Q&A panel right now, I am completing a PhD post-residency. Do those years count towards public service loan forgiveness? The PhD programs are really complicated, right? Because sometimes you're in role and, and, and some academic residency programs as well, but this happened to my wife, right? Because she did her academic residency or she did a residency in academic, academic institution. She was enrolled in a master's of clinical sciences at the same time, which triggered her loans to be deferred because the system is set up to recognize when you're in school again, right? Same thing happens with these PhD programs. If you're taking classes, right, you can see your loans deferred automatically. Right now, if your loans are already in repayment, you can waive or deny or tell them ahead of time to ignore that automatic deferment request that comes with being enrolled at least half time in some of these programs like PhDs or MPHs or masters of clinical sciences, right? So you have to contact your loan servicer and say, look, I, I'm starting this program. You're gonna probably get a request to defer my student loans. I, wanna, I don't wanna waive that 
request. Sometimes they'll make you fill out a formal form. Other times you can just verbally tell them. But I would also be keeping a close eye on what my loans are doing during that particular program to make sure that they're still in a repayment plan and not automatically deferred. Right, because that, you know, whether or not your loans are going to be potentially eligible for public service loan forgiveness during that PhD program depends on two things. Whether or not you're able to keep them in repayment, right, deferment will never count towards public service loan forgiveness. So you have to keep them in repayment. And then whether or not you can get somebody there to sign off on the fact that you're, quote, employed and working at least 30 hours per week in that institution. Right. And some folks are not willing to call those PhD programs employment. Right. They have other terms for them. Right. But I believe, again, they should be eligible, but I don't get to sign those forms. So you kind of have to, you know, sit down and talk with the mentor or the HR rep or whoever is the person who would be filling out that form and signing, acknowledging that you're meeting those requirements to see if they're willing to uh, do that for you during that PhD program. Okay, marriage, it's complicated, right? So it depends on how you file your taxes, whether or not your spouse has student loans, the state that you live in, uh, the difference in your incomes, right? All of these things play a role in deciding whether or not it's going to make sense for you to file your taxes jointly or separately when you're married and are managing student loans. Now, if you both have student loans, like this is the case between my wife and I, we're, we're what I call the double vet, double debt household. Right, so we we both have student debt. We it makes sense for us to file jointly because our payment on our student loans are otherwise lower than if we filed separately and each applied for income-driven repayment plans separately. Right now, that's not always the case, but it tends to um, be the case if you both have student loans um, and there's not significant differences between your incomes. Right. There can be cases where I see, you know, one spouse, uh, one spouse is married to a surgeon who has a high student loan balance and the other spouse is working for a nonprofit and making a quarter of what the other spouse is earning. And it does make sense for them to file their taxes separately in some of those cases. Right? It really just depends on the, the makeup of the household debt and finances. If you, if you as a veterinarian are the only one holding the debt, then it often, and you're married, it often pays to file separately if your spouse has an income, right? Because you're generally, unless your spouse's income is very low, it, you're generally going to save more in monthly payments than you're going to pay extra in taxes or lose in tax filing benefits. But you still have to go through that exercise, right? To make sure and confirm that with you for your particular circumstances. But oftentimes, I find that you're going to save more by filing separately than you're going to pay um, extra in taxes for most veterinary circumstances. This is an interesting bonus that you might want to investigate with your accountant. If you've been filing your taxes separately for the last several years that the pandemic forbearance benefits have been in place, thinking that that was going to help keep your student loan payment lower, you can go back and amend those tax returns from separate to jointly right, to get the tax benefits, right? but you can't go the other way around. Like you can't go from jointly to separately, but you can change from separately to jointly for up to the past three tax years. And that might make sense for some people because we had all these fits and starts, <clears throat> excuse me, of people of, of not knowing when our payments were gonna start back up. People are still filing separately. And because we now finally have the formal end of the forbearance benefits, we can say, yeah, you know, it didn't make sense for me to file my taxes separately in 2020 and 2021. I could go back and amend those. Do you live in a community property state? You know, California, Texas are the biggies. Louisiana, Wisconsin, kind of a weird outlier. Most of the other ones are kind of along the West Coast. If you live in a community property state and you file your taxes separately, Generally speaking, they're going to take your household earned income, half is going to go on your tax return, half is going to go on your spouse's tax return. So there are certain instances where that can produce a tax return AGI that will have an otherwise lower number than if you used your actual income, which can be extremely beneficial 
from an income driven repayment strategy. So it kind of falls into that category of living and working overseas where we see some really funny things happening with people's US tax return AGIs that otherwise makes income driven repayment very, very beneficial. So if you live in one of those community property states, investigate filing your taxes separately and what that might look like from an income driven repayment standpoint. All right, so never been a better time to consolidate with that one-time count adjustment. If you do your student loan physical exam and you discover loans that don't have direct in the name, consider consolidating them, right? Because you'll preserve your forgiveness clock time and you may even add to it. If you have loans with differing amounts of forgiveness time, consolidate before the end of the year, right? This is more of a, a rule for those folks that are graduating and kind of comes back to that, what do I recommend to students? And if you're in a position to talk to students about this, particularly if you're a mentor for one of these PhD academic residency programs that start immediately after vet school, you have to have those students, those graduating students, consolidate their loans as quickly as they can after they graduate, right? Because one of the biggest heart wrenchers is when those folks start those combined academic PhD residency programs, during their grace period, their student loan grace period, if they finish school, if they start that program and their loans get put stuck in that in-school deferment status before they get a chance to end that grace period, they're gonna be stuck in that status until they finish that program, right? And some of these PhD programs last seven or eight years, right? That's a long time for you to be stuck in quote, in-school deferment where your loans are just accruing interest and it'll get added to your principal. It's just cruel, but it's, it's how the system is set up. Right, but you can avoid that if you graduate, consolidate, you have an opportunity to end that grace period, get your loans into repayment. And once that grace period messiness is over, you can end or, or choose to waive that in-school deferment going forward. Right, but if you don't catch that in time, right, then you're kind of stuck in that status until you either leave that program or you complete it. Oh, let's see, I, I think I actually have an uh, example of this. So this is a particular person, and this happens, you know, this is just part of the messiness of, um, you know, graduating, a lot of stuff happening after graduation, um, and then trying to deal with your student loans. Sometimes things fall through the cracks. So this is a relatively recent new grad who tried to consolidate their loans, but only part of them ended up getting consolidated. Right, so I can see I've got 10 loans here that are all direct loans, but when I look at the loan types, I see unsubsidized and I see consolidated, right? And they used to have grad plus loans. So it just tells me that their grad plus loans were the ones that got consolidated, but the unsubsidized loans were left outside that consolidation, right? And this is just part of that messiness. Now, this was a great opportunity to clean that up, right? That one-time count adjustment. I can consolidate this consolidation loan with these unconsolidated loans, and I can make sure that this loan, which has more forgiveness eligible time, will be transferred to all of these loans through that new consolidation loan, right? But when we, when we recommend that new graduate veterinarians graduate, consolidate, and end their grace period, ideally, it's all of their loans get consolidated. Here was, here was an instance where only part of them did. Right, so you kind of have to follow this process through, double check on them, you know, make sure that things happen the way we wanted them to happen. All right, I'm going to skip ahead. So the top mistakes I see, right, assuming an income driven plan won't work for you. Right, particularly if you're heading towards public service loan forgiveness or other otherwise working for a nonprofit employer. Procrastination when it comes to consolidation, we're seeing that in spades right now, right? Three plus years, more than two years, this one-time forgiveness count adjustment has been available for people to take advantage of. We're knocking on the door at the end of the year. People are still wondering how they can take advantage of that, right? I know everybody's busy, but there's, some of this stuff, again, is not you're, this is, these are like ships passing in the night, right? The, some of these benefits are so crazy uh, good that when they're gone and, you know, that first person we're going to have to tell on January 1st that, sorry, you're too late is going to really suck, right? So don't be that person, right? 
take advantage of these opportunities while they're available. Uh, new grads, singles choosing an income-based uh, plan instead of save or pay as you earn, it really never makes sense to start with IBR as your repayment plan particularly now with the newer versions that are available, but I see that happening all the time. And that's more of a function of the nomenclature, right? For whatever reason, because IBR was the first major income-driven plan that was available, everybody calls all of them IBR. So they call their loan service and they're like, I need to be put in an IBR. And they'll put you in IBR, right? But it's probably not the best plan for you, right? So make sure that you're choosing the plan that's actually the most beneficial for you. Forbearance deferments outside of the pandemic forbearance benefit, which again was one of those special unicorn kind of events, right? Forbearance and deferment don't make sense, right? You want to keep your loans in income driven repayment. Don't miss your anniversary date, your renewals, right? That's going to have negative consequences. You don't want to have to undo those, all those although those consequences are not as severe as they were before July 1st of 2023, you still don't want to miss your renewal. Paying more than your income requires. I see people doing this all the time. I, you know, I get it. Those income driven plan payments sometimes are really low. And you're looking at that and you're like, wow, I can afford to pay more. Right? But you're probably just burning that money. Right. And it kills me too when I see employers that are throwing money at people's student loans who are otherwise going to hit forgiveness. They're burning that money too. Right. They're just burning it on your behalf. So paying extra towards your student loans uh, when you're due to hit forgiveness doesn't make sense financially, right? There's better stuff that you can be doing with that money. Don't ever put your student loans ahead of more critical financial wellness items, right? There's always other things that you can be doing. Um, you need to manage your student loans appropriately, but don't let them take center stage in your financial planning, right? They just don't deserve that kind of weight. Switching away from income-driven repayment plans or refinancing your federal student loans into a private loan, particularly if you're on some kind of forgiveness track. Right? And you just never know when that might present itself. So resist that urge to refinance your loans. I don't see this as much as we did when we were in that crazy low interest rate environment. Right? It's much harder to get a really, really low interest rate on, on student loan refinances, but it really never made sense before either. Right? But it was more tempting when you could get a 2.5% interest rate on your student loan. Right? But when you run student loan repayment simulations, you're going to see an effective interest rate that oftentimes is way less than even 2.5% and sometimes negative. Right? So refinancing your student loans, it's about more than an interest rate. All of these benefits that you get um, are way, go way beyond just an interest rate. So you just be very careful when it comes to that. Here are these items that I think are more important in terms of planning, um, financial planning. One starts with the budget, right? You got to measure your ins and outs. Now, this is this is um, we've been collecting signal form data for those that we help on the student debt message board area for years now, and um, it roughly breaks out, you know, 60-40, 50-50, 55-45 in terms of do you have a budget? And I think that it's probably actually lower than this. Right. So um, most people don't have a budget, which makes financial planning really hard. Right. You have to have some idea. You don't have to manage it down to a penny. Right. But you have to have some idea of what your ins and outs are. Right. So you so you know how to plan for this and which things should take priority. Building your retirement savings, I would start with at least 10 to 15 percent of your gross, ideally in tax advantage savings or uh, savings accounts like 401ks or 403bs, depending on your employer and what they have set up. Making sure that you're paying off other less flexible debt first, that student loan balance may be the biggest number, but your credit card debt, other private loans, other debt is way more dangerous than your federal student loan. You don't have to pay your student loans to zero before you buy a home or a practice or that, you know, that mobile unit for your practice, right? You can, you can and should be buying those things before you pay off your student loans, right? You just manage your student loans together with those sorts of things. And it can actually make navigating those big purchases easier if you're using an income-driven repayment plan. Uh, the ones that, you know, people that say, I'm, you know, I can't start a family until I pay off my student loans, that, that's one of those self-imposed barriers, right? You, there's, if you're paying your student loans reasonably, then you can start a family whenever you're ready to do so. If you are gonna manage your student loans, 
based on your income and you're projected to reach forgiveness, then plan for it, right? And what does that look like, right? So we haven't actually looked at the student loan repayment simulator, right? But let's let's take a look, right? Let's take let's send this person's information. So when you upload that information into the My Student Loans tool, you're going to have an option to send this information over to the loan repayment simulator, and it's going to pull all of that summary information over. Right now, this person graduated in this person actually graduated in 2022. Right, we're going to give them a year of credit in a repayment plan. Right now, this is a more recent graduate, right? So they're going to have more of a, you know, let's say they're in the middle of their residency and they're, let's give them a $150,000 salary after they finish their residency, right? But I'm going to have to put some residency income information in here ahead of time, right? Let's say they've got a couple of years left in their residency. Right, let's keep them single for the time being, but you can put in whether or not you're married. Yes, no, the ever popular not yet, right? If that's imminent for you, if you've got dependents, you can add them. If you're planning on having children in the future, you can add them, including the years, which will factor into the discretionary income calculation. We'll start you off with an estimated tax rate of forgiveness of 30%. You can choose whatever you think is appropriate there. Poverty growth rate factors into that discretionary income formula or the poverty guidelines and how they change every year. That roughly tracks inflation. We've been in a higher inflationary environment lately, but generally speaking, that tracks somewhere between you know, two and 3% over the long haul. If you're saving for forgiveness, you can put what your return on that savings is. We run our simulation. We start to compare what our options look like. Right? So this person's in Pejorn right now, Right, we can see what that payment would be during that residency, otherwise lower using save. I also know that my unpaid interest will not accrue while I'm using that. Right, so I am going to think about using save. In this particular case, I don't end up hitting forgiveness, but it's very, very close. I end up paying the balance to zero. Right, I'm going to come back over here quickly. This person's actually eligible for the new version of IBR, right? So that means I can consider using save for the next five years while I complete my training, keep my unpaid interest balance low, switch over to the new version of IBR, hit forgiveness at 19 years, right? That will produce a lower monthly payment and it'll actually, or total cost, and it'll actually be lower than this. We don't have a way to directly measure all of that yet, but we're working on a uh, simulation that will show you what a switch from save to IBR will look like, but I do know that it'll be lower than this, right? So that's kind of what would be on my radar for this particular person. I would probably, because I'm eligible for the new version of IBR, I would get the loans out of pay, get them in the save, to keep my unpaid interest balance low, and then target switching to the new version of IBR after I finish my training, at which point I can reassess at that point. I don't want to compare this, especially for any of these internship residency specialty projections. I don't want to compare that against a standard 10 year plan because that's not real, right? Because this requires me to make payments of $2,300 a month while I'm earning $45,000 a year. And that's just not possible, right? So someday we'll, we'll put in a fix for that. But right now you just kind of have to sanity check that yourself, right? You, you, it's not a very realistic goal. Now, if you're done, Right, and you want to compare, you know, where you are, but you're going to have more years in repayment, and see, am I going to hit forgiveness? How close is that payment to what my standard ten-year repayment plan is? You can factor all of that in by editing and altering these inputs in the simulator to see how that would play out for you. And if you're working towards public service loan forgiveness, there's a switch here for yes, how many years you've logged towards public service loan forgiveness. Right, so we can factor that in as well. So that's that's a high level overview of how the simulator works in terms of making sense of whether or not you're projected to reach forgiveness. All right, you'll pay your student loans off. It's okay to make payments based on your income. In fact, I think it's a better way to go. 
right? Because it's going to control your monthly payments. Um, your income will pay your balance to zero or it won't, right? Either is fine. If you're going to hit a potential taxable version of forgiveness, then plan for it. Right? You don't have to worry about planning for it while you're in those residency years, but afterwards, I would plan for it. Uh, focus on your financial wellness first. Right? Those are going to pay off bigger dividends than making extra payments beyond what your income requires. If you have uh, questions, reach out. Right, We've got this help that we provide to veterinarians. Um, we do that mostly through the student debt message board area. Right, so up here you can see when you're logged in and using the student debt message, uh, student debt center, you can click on that student debt message board area. It'll take you into VIN, right? And you can see what Beck and I have been doing um, a lot <laughs> recently. <laughs> we've been replying and, and building, you know, this knowledge base of repayment strategies for pretty much any career path that you can possibly think of. But there's a lot of answers to be had in there, uh, but there's also that's also where you can post your questions as well. Um, and you can post anonymously. Most of these discussions are anonymous because they involve sensitive financial information, but you'll kind of get an idea of the type of information that you really need to know in order to answer some of these student loan repayment strategy questions. All right, I see a question here. Uh, can you explain the rules with how long you need to switch between save and pay? It seems as though you're referring to five years of save before switching and maybe I missed something. So yeah, the, the, the switching between save and the new version of IBR, that's the only time that's going to make sense, right? A switch from save to a new version of IBR. Pay as you earn, you're not gonna be able to do that, right? Because pay as you earn is not gonna be available after July 1st of 2020. 24, right? So if you use save for five years and you're planning to switch to pay as you earn, you're not going to be able to do that, right? But say pay as you earn and IBR 2014 are very similar plans, right? So if you're eligible for the new version of IBR, like this person is, right? They, they don't have to worry about losing access to pay as you earn, right? They can use save for that five-year period and if they're still on a track to hit forgiveness, they can switch before they reach that five-year maximum to the new version of IBR. But if you are closer to this person, right, if you don't, either you don't have access to pay or you have access to pay as you earn and not the new version of IBR, then you're not going to be able to switch, right? You're looking at either staying with pay if you're already in it or switching to save and sticking with it, right? There will be no strategy unless they change the rules again before now and, and July 1st of next summer, page order is going away, right? So if you're not already in it, you won't be able to pick it after that day, which means you won't be able to switch from save to pay. Hope that, okay, that makes sense, great. Any other questions? or anything that I didn't cover that you guys thought that I would. All right, if I've been in PageWorn for five years and now have a projected save amount that is a monthly lower than pay, I should switch to save. I am also five years into public service loan forgiveness. Yeah, so that's a, that's a, right, that's a good one, right? So that, no, it depends on when you're due to renew again, right? But if your current save monthly payment would be lower then you're scheduled to pay under pay as you earn in October and switch now, right? But if your pay as you earn payment is lower than what you would pay under save until your next due to renew, then wait until the next time you're due to renew and then switch to save. But eventually, specifically if you're working towards public service loan forgiveness, you wanna end up in save, right? Because it's going to have the lowest monthly payment compared to pay as you earn the next time you're, at least by the next time you're due to renew. November of 2023. So nobody is due to renew in November of 2023, right? We talked about that earlier, right? So if, you're, if your anniversary date says November 2023, then it's going to get kicked to November 2024, right? So if you've got a really low pay-as-you-earn payment until November of 2024, then keep it, right? But if, if you could apply for save right now and the payment would be lower, 
then your pay as you earn payment will be when payments start this October, then switch now. Right, so that's going to depend on what your recent adjusted gross income is, what your current income is, which one's going to generate a lower monthly payment, right? And if that is still not lower than your current monthly pay as you earn payment, yeah, right. So I, I have a really low pay as you earn payment currently, and I recently had a huge pay increase, then keep it, right? Keep your pay as you earn payment as low as possible for as long as you can, right? So if you're not due to renew again until November of 2024, Right, keep that pay as you earn payment really low, right? That's going to be really beneficial for reaching public service loan forgiveness. And then the next time you're due to renew, then you switch to save, right? Because under your higher income, that payment under save is going to be lower than it will be compared to pay as you earn. My plan end date is stated as December 6th of 2023. Will this automatically change or do I need to do something to change it? So if you're if your income, your, I'm assuming you're asking about your anniversary date, it's in December of 2023, it should get kicked to 20, December 2024, right? So yeah, it hasn't happened yet. And I think I saw something on the studentaid.gov website where they're hoping to get all of those data files updated in the next month or two, but with the you know payment restarting and everything, there's been a lot going on. So, uh, but that's what the, that's what the rules say. Right, so you should see that reflected in your student aid data file, hopefully sooner rather than later. But if your current income-driven plan anniversary dates is December of 2023, then it should get kicked to December 2024. I have to contact my loan servicer about the anniversary date. I would, right? I would reach out to them. They, you know, unfortunately, you never know what the loan servicer are going to say, and most of the time they say something wrong, right? That's just the way it is, right? So you can call your loan servicer and say, look. I'm on the studentaid.gov website and it says that nobody is required to renew between now and six months after this forbearance benefit ends, but my anniversary date is December 23, 2023. Can you confirm for me that my next anniversary date will be December of 2024? And they should be able to say yes. And they should be able to reflect that on their website if they're not already, right? And worst case scenario, hopefully by November, you'll see that reflected in your student aid data file. Right, but uh, you know, keep asking questions. But again, there is no, according to the rules, there is no scenario where anybody has to provide income documentation in December of 2023. Cool, thank you, I appreciate that. Any other questions? Aside from hitting forgiveness earlier, can you reiterate the benefits of pay over save? Yeah, it, well, it's hitting forgiveness sooner. Right, and usually hitting forgiveness sooner means you'll have a lower projected total cost, usually, not always, right? Now, for some people, that's the most important thing, being done with student loan repayment sooner rather than later, but it also is likely to produce the lowest total repayment cost, right? The kicker there is that you don't have a lot of time to plan for the tax if you have to pay the tax. Now, many of you are in a higher earning bracket than most GPs are, right? So that should still be doable. But depending on your student loan balance, if you're staring at forgiveness under pay as you earn in, you know, 10 years or something, it can be pretty tough to work that potential tax amount into your budget if it's a big number, right? In those cases, then you may want to look at save. Right, because not only will it kind of kick that can down the road a few more years, but it'll generally lower that tax amount. Right, so that's where that and I call that the pickle. Right, so you know those people that are kind of stuck between choosing pay or save because they don't have access to the new version of IBR. That's the that's the pickle. Right, you either are on a track to hit forgiveness sooner, in which case that could be a pretty big tax that you have to aggressively plan for, but you'll be done with student loan repayment sooner, or you can switch to save. You just have to be cool with being in repayment for another five years and the benefits that come with save, right? Which are the lower payments, the lower tax at the end, right? So that's not a question I can answer for you. I and mean, we can kind of guide you through the objective measures that we use and things that you can consider, but that that's one that ultimately kind of, that's on you, right? You're going to have to just decide one way or the other. The good news is you can always choose to use save later, right? So, you know, for the people that are really kind of analysis paralysis there, 
you know, and if you're eligible for save and you're, or you're, you're in pay as you earn and you're uh, not sure what to do, you know, you can stick with it for now, right? And you can always choose to switch to save later if for some reason it looks like your income might be lower or longer than you were anticipating, right? And you could really benefit more from that save um, unpaid interest subsidy. All right, any other questions? Well, we wait to see if there's any other questions remaining. I did want to remind everyone, uh, I think Jordan's going to drop the link for the CE evaluation into the chat here. It'll also be sent out in the follow-up email. So go ahead and fill out that form. Um, and that follow-up email will be coming from student debt at vinfoundation.org. And then your CE certificate will come from Jordan at vinfoundation.org. But I don't see any additional questions. Great. Well, thanks everybody for the engagement and all of the uh, the Q and A. That was great, great questions. And you guys will all receive a a link to the recording for this and a link to the slides uh, to click through later if um you know need a refresher on anything. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for moderating and and thanks again to ACVIM for uh, for bringing this together. I look forward to doing, to, to doing the next couple of sessions we have with you all and, and continuing to help in any way that we can. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, thank you.